What is the truth in the stories we are told? We've been given a story of a world fueled by separation. We've become separate from one another, separate from the earth, ultimately separate from the true nature of ourselves. It's time we learn the truth. It's time you rewrite your story. It's time to realign with who it is that you really are. This is the fifth dimension. You are infinite and eternal. We are infinite and eternal. Our natural essence, we could say, is, is simply being. We have this awakening coming together as a perfect storm. We're ready for this. We have the capacity inside. We just got to find that. All right, everybody, welcome into the Fifth Dimension Podcast. For today's show, I'm joined by a special guest. I'm joined by Dr. Fred Moss, who is the author of Creating Creative Eight, Healing Through Creativity and Self-Expression. He's also a speaker, transformational coach, and somebody I'm very excited to have on the show and talk to. So, Dr. Fred, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I love that uh, that's the introduction you gave me today. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm looking at my book, The Creative Ape, up on the wall there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. It, however we pitch each other, right, whatever we say about each other, that becomes who you know me as. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's how you got introduced to me by was that. So I guess for now, we'll start from there. But all after right. all, really, I am just Fred Moss. So great to be on your show. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you here. And, you know, I would love, I guess, to start, um, you know, I did mention all those things and, you know, you've been working in the mental health field for, you know, over 40 years. Uh, I Could you give like a, I guess, a background of your own journey, maybe what you would feel called to share with the listeners, but also sort of where you find your focus to be now and what uh, really resonates for you, I guess, when I ask that question and um, you know, just to give a good, the listeners a good uh, feel from where you're coming from and the perspective that you hold. Sure. So um, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. And, uh, and the reason why that's kind of important, you know, it's like, oh, he's going to start right from the day he was born. And it's true. I am from March 1st, 1958 is when I popped out and I popped out with the really uh, uh, already written job description to bring joy connection to the world around me. Like that was there. I've had that full-time job since arrival. Hmm. Who was waiting for me and my family is two parents and a brother, uh, two brothers who are 10 and 14 years older than me, who were in a fair degree of chaos and disarray when I arrived. And it was, the hope was that little Freddie could bring a new connection, a new joy, a new level of communication a new level of, um, I don't know, amusement, entertainment, growth. Uh, and that's how I, that's what I arrived with that, you know, with that uh, being uh, the goal, like the goal uh, uh, of, of what I was to bring to earth. So I spent the first several years, um, you know, really watching my family communicate and becoming very, very enchanted and committed to communication and the value of communication. And you know, watching these two people or four people talk to each other and then go off and do what they do and learning the language and learning how to speak my own way and how to listen my own way, learning that there's at least four different realities to everything. And um, I was precocious, you know, they taught me how to talk and how to be art quite articulate and, and how to do math and how to read and all that before I even went to kindergarten. So I was advanced, you know, in kindergarten, most people don't know how to read or do math, but I did. And they're throwing mm -hmm. blocks and picking their nose and I'm like doing, you know, addition <laughs> problems. And um, there, and, and not that I wasn't throwing blocks and, and picking my nose too. Right. I, I was doing all, <laughs> all plus, you know. Right. Uh, and, you know, communication remained the thing I was most focused on. As, a, as a, someone going through elementary school, um, none of the teachers who had me as a student will ever forget having Fred in their class, I'm quite sure. And, you know, it was I was always uh, smart and I was always somewhat bored. I was always funny, um, you know, twisting the language or bringing joy into the classroom. And sometimes that wasn't even welcome. The teachers didn't want me to do that, <laughs> but so it, it didn't matter because joy wins. And connection wins. So I would do it anyways. Um, 
But what I really began to get is I wanted to become a master communicator. And I remember even thinking about that uh, in, late in, in elementary school and thinking, okay, when I finally get with the big kids in junior high, they'll start teaching me how to communicate because obviously you learn as you grow up. When I finally got to junior high, it was totally disappointing because they were communicating worse than the elementary school kids were. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, it's not junior high. It, it must be high school. This is gonna be where it goes. So then, uh, you know, I got into high school, all excited that I was gonna learn how to communicate. And frankly, of course, it's even worse in high school than it was in junior high. And I'm you know, doing all the shit that high school people do. And it's like, okay, I guess we're gonna put communication on the back burner until I get to college. Because obviously in college, that's where you're going to learn to communicate. I mean, I'm going to go to University of Michigan because they got the cool helmets and stuff. And, you know, and it's my local school. I'm and I'm like, you know, go blue. And, and mm -hmm. so I, I do what I can to, you know, trip the trigger so that I can get to the University of Michigan. And, and I arrive at Michigan knowing that that's going to be the place where I learn to communicate. And, 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 and didn't happen. Not happening, <laughs> not happening there. Now, you know where it did happen? It did happen in the streets of Ann Arbor. In mm -hmm. the streets of Ann Arbor, I began to communicate a little bit more. I was free. Went, but that meant that I wasn't doing school. It meant that, you know, instead of school, I was hitting the streets or being out there in the, you know, at the Arboretum or being out there in the Commons or being out there in, the, you know, in the Diag or in the city. And I began to, it isn't that I despise school, but I saw school as the antithesis of communication because I would have to just sit there, watch a professor, listen to a professor, try to remember everything they said, and then regurgitate it exactly as they gave it to me and I'll call that learning. Mm. Right. That's the furthest thing from learning. That's the furthest thing from communication. And I could only do that for so long. So I decided to drop out. Uh, in my sophomore year and got in a Greyhound and came out to California again, did a whole thing and, you know, searching for myself. And um, it was pretty fun, you know, uh, but it was pretty aimless. And then I decided, well, this is only going to work for so long. I should probably get a degree in something. So I went back to Michigan, um, hoping to get a degree. I, it was like, what should I do? And someone said, do computers. I was like, okay. The biggest computer in Michigan was at University of Michigan. It was this, it was this, you know, acre uh, like one computer you know mm. and it was like uh, okay i'll go do computer science so i went back did fortran and cobalt and all that and uh, you know i'd only held my interest for so long too and i had to drop out again so i came home in 1980 i told my mom that uh, mom uh, thanks for the opportunity to go to college but i'm never going back for any reason ever so <laughs> you should just know that i'm not going to school and I'm going to have to build my life on some other way because school doesn't work for me. And she's like, okay, Fred, that's great. Uh, listen, uh, we're going to have to get you a job then. I'm like, oh, you know, moms will be like that. And so I, she got me an application uh, for a state mental health hospital for adolescents. Um, and I filled out the application. I figured I'd stay about three weeks, you know, for the orientation. They paid me 40 hours, like 13 bucks an hour. It says 420 bucks or 520 bucks. And then times three, I should be able to buy a car and hit the road again, you know, go find out what my life is about, like for real, without a Greyhound, like in a Volkswagen yeah. or something, you know. And I really thought I was only going to stay through the orientation, but my friend convinced me to come up to the floors in the fourth week. And there I began, uh, there was an important change that happened in that in January 1980, which was that I began to communicate with these kids, these human beings, these people, you know, who were housed there in a way that was eye to eye, respecting them for everything that they were, including the unfortunate, slightly unfortunate circumstance that had them living there at that time. And almost reliably, it was pretty unfortunate. But I was communicating, connecting, creating, being in a conversation with these folks. And not only were they healing as a result of me showing them the respect and listening all the way down to the bottom with them, but I was healing too in a very real process. I was learning again what I already knew from that playpen back in the day, which was the connection was the source of all healing. Mm. So I stuck with that job for a little while, week after week, you know, first it was like, okay, well, maybe I can get a Mazda instead of a VW. And then, I, you know, maybe I can actually buy a new car. You know, I started like staying, cause I can quit in three weeks. You mm -hmm. know, it's just like any, 
four weeks now, you know, 30 day notice, I'm just out of here. But in the meantime, I might as well hone my communication skills for a moment, make a few paychecks so I can buy my car so I can drive around the country and get what my life is all about, you know? Well, that worked out really good. I worked afternoon shift. I took the kids on great field trips and it was afternoon shift was just fabulous. And, um, but the thing I hated about that job, really seriously hated was the way that psychiatry of all things dealt with the kids. I could mm -hmm. not stand it. You know, we would call up the doc, the doc and say like, uh, Jason is up too late. Or we'd say, Tim just got in a fight with Johnny. Or we'd say, uh, Billy stopped listening to the nurse. And it's like, and he would come around. Maybe he'd interview the kid, usually not. He'd sit down in the nursing office, he'd open up the chart, he'd write an order, and then we, the child care workers, had to hold the kid down while we injected him full of some toxic medication and put him out of his misery. And if the child stayed submissive and, you know, entirely quiet for 12 or 4, 24 hours, we would call that a success story. I was like, you know what, this is just mm -hmm. atrocious. This is just heated. This is barbaric. This is horrible. I cannot stand for this. And then the child would come out, you know, after sleeping in the quiet room for the night or something and, you know, still be slurring words or walking, you know, walking gingerly. And I just could not handle that. I just hated it. Now, my oldest brother was already a psychiatrist and I decided that psychiatry was supposed to be a communication field. So I'm going to go back and get to the top of the rung for communication by being a psychiatrist extraordinaire. Of course, you know, Evan, that meant that I had to go back to school. And um, mm -hmm. so I did, you know, I went back to school in Detroit and Wayne and uh, slowly but surely while I was working, I kept my moonlighting job, uh, you know, and, and, and working with childcare and completed my undergraduate degree well enough to eventually get accepted in Chicago at the Northwestern University Medical School. And I went there and continued to moonlight as a child care worker, even while I was in medical school, because that's really where my that's really where my passion is. What you're really looking at here is a glorified child care worker. I am just <laughs> still a child care worker. That's all I've been for 42 years. But in the meantime, I picked up a few different awards and a few different diplomas and a few different accolades and a few different promotions, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this CV now. No, well, first thing, you know, now I'm a psychiatrist and now I have a child and adolescent and Prozac gets introduced to the world. Now Prozac has changed the world at least as much as any of the things that are going on in our present world today. You know, um, most people don't know that, but you know, in 1987, when Prozac was introduced, all of a sudden misery became pathological. If you were having depression or pain or, in, or anxiety or fears or any of those things for any reason, they equated that to you being sick. And if you were sick, then you could take a pill to get well. And that pill in the first part was essentially Prozac. Mm -hmm. Now Prozac didn't work anywhere near as well as it said it would, but all of a sudden you can imagine your hero here, Dr. Fred became a psychopharmacological expert. The exact reason I went into psychiatry in the first place was now flipped on me and I had crossed enemy lines. Mm -hmm. I was now actually doing that which the doctors I hated at the at the hospital were doing. I was now doing, and you know, I was like prescribing tens of thousands of medicine, tens of thousands of prescriptions over the next thirty years. But you know, it wasn't just a straight game, but it was soul sacrifice each and every day because I really, really don't like prescribing medicines and I really don't like diagnosing people as anything less than perfect. But I had to keep doing that. I had to keep telling people there was something wrong with them, even if I didn't think there was. And sometimes I would say, you know, that I don't know that there's anything wrong with you. And you know what they would do? They would get furious with me. Mm. I didn't come to you to hear that I was okay. I'm like, <laughs> okay. I, that's the only field in medicine, by the way, where you go and absolutely hope that there's something wrong with you. Hmm. Right. So if I tell people they're normal, they just go next door to find a doctor who tell them they're abnormal. It's a re there's a real draw to being abnormal. So I was starting to see all the ludicrous incongruencies inside the psychiatric field now. 
And fast forward a little bit. In 2006, I began to do something that some would say is a little radical because doctors aren't really taught how to take people off of medicine. And I started taking my more um, low risk patients off of medicine and see how they would do. Like, you okay, you think you're doing okay, but I think if you came off medicine, you may be even better. And that's exactly what happened. I took people off their antidepressants and their life, uh, their, their life quality improved dramatically. Mm. Then it started happening completely reliable. Like everyone I took off their medicine, their life improved dramatically. But doctors aren't taught how to take people off of medicine. We're only taught how to add, change, or increase medicine. So it looks like it's a radical intervention to stop medicine. Right. Rather than the fact that it's an absolutely radical intervention to start medicines. Mm. Stopping medicine shouldn't be very radical. After all, if the shit's not working, then why keep taking it? Right. Absolutely. But that isn't how the science, that isn't how the system is built. And there's, you know, so when I began doing that, I started doing it with the medium risk patients. And guess what? They, of course, they all got better too. And then I started doing it with the even occasional high risk patient. And they all got better too. It's like everyone got better off their medicine. So I started designing a new way to look at this whole thing, which was having a diagnosis and taking a treatment for it in the form of medication often perpetuates, if not causes, the symptoms it's marketed to treat. Mm. It's a really sweet business model, by the way. If you and I could come up with a business model where the product actually caused the symptoms that it made you need the product in the first place. Insured profits. There's, there's a pretty nice profit built there. It's, yeah. You don't have to be a superstar mathematician to see a, a pretty, uh, pretty wild profit that's built into that model. Like maybe that would be, it could create a multinational corporation that actually profited at several billion dollars a day if we did that right. Well, guess what? Mm. That's exactly what that industry is right. right now, for sure. It's the number one most profitable industry in the history of planet Earth, actually. Mm. There's no industry where you get to pay 200 bucks for a little plastic like pouch of powder that you line up across the street for every month and make sure never to miss out on that then causes or at least perpetuates the symptoms that have you need to take it in the first place. <laughs> it's a racket. It's, it's pretty dead serious, man. It's pretty dead serious. So the soul sacrifice cat, you know, cut by, you know, death by a thousand cuts is for me, you know, it's like, boom, Boom, every day, every day I was having to lie to myself or bite my tongue or be so sad. You know, parents would come in, can you medicate my kids? And I'd be like, hmm. Hmm, I guess so. I'm the only one here to do it and that's what you want. But hmm. look, if we wanted something else but medication, we wouldn't have come to a psychiatrist. I was like, okay, right. So, you know. I didn't like starting people on medicine. And I really started seeing that I wasn't going to be able to last my whole life in this job. But I did last 30 years. I did last 40,000 patients. I did work in every single area of psychiatry that's available, including orphanages, inpatients, outpatients, residential home, partial hospital program, uh, homeless shelters, nursing homes, uh, three quarters houses, rehabs, jails, prisons. I have a history in all of those places for sure. Mm -hmm. And a leadership history. Like you and your doctor, all of a sudden they just they hire you and make you the leader of the building. It's like, oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for so much power. <laughs> so my CV, dude, is killer. I have the sweetest resume ever because I've worked in every corner of psychiatry 40,000 patients later. But the reason it's so great is that I quit the last job every time. Right. And I quit the last job because I even that one made my soul sacrifice. So mm. I couldn't hang forever in a place where every day I hated what I did. Right. I stayed long enough to hope that I could find a little corner where I could be in communication, where I could bring communication as a primary form of healing. And in general, they would let me do that for a while. But ultimately, what they really wanted was for me to prescribe medicines and diagnose people. 
So we fast forward again to like 2000. I did a lot of telepsychiatry around the world. I lived in Israel, lived in Europe, lived in a bunch of different spaces and also lived all over the United States. Um, you know, uh, and when you do telepsychiatry back in the day before before electronic communication between became the only way we actually communicate anymore anyways. Um, it was a place for me to learn so much about how psychiatry is done, what is the same all over the country, what idiosyncrasies are different, etc. And so in 2016, I began to back out on all entirely and I started create I created the Welcome to Humanity brand, the Welcome to Humanity, um, you know, fundamentals, uh, foundation, the framework. And uh, that, you know, it's now become pretty self explanatory. Welcome to humanity, all pieces of humanity, embracing everything human, including the pain, the suffering, the misery, the atrocities, including all the things that are intolerable, including all of those things, along with the miracles, the ecstatic things, the beauty things, the comfort things, all of these experiences, they're all essentially human. Can we embrace them all for being as exquisite as they are on this smorgasbord of a table that allows for nearly an infinite amount of experiences that if we just categorize them as being a gift of humanity, even the most painful ones, can we get a new way of looking at life here. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. telling you I'm eager to have my next most painful experience. I'm not. Right. I hate pain just as much as anybody. And here's the thing I really want to make clear to you and your listeners. I'm also not suggesting that those people who are sure that they're having pain are somehow making it up. I don't right. mean to minimize or diminish the pain that people have. Frankly, quite the opposite. I mean to emphasize the pain. I mean to actually pay attention to the pain as being a pain that is being delivered to us as a function of being human, not as a function of being sick. Big difference. It's a key difference. Huge difference. Huge. Yeah. You know, Most people these days, if they're sad or depressed or anxious or nervous or afraid or sleepless or confused or listening to the committee or whatever is going on, are pretty sure that there's something wrong with them. Right. Right. Do you know that it is a quality of life to know that there's something wrong with you? Like we all, you know, there's something wrong with you. You know that. I mean, in your deep, dark self, you know, you know, you're weird as shit. You know that, mm -hmm. you know, you're way weirder than anyone else, you know, because we all know we're the weirdest ones we know. <laughs> That's right. just part of being normal is knowing that you're abnormal. So if I can give you cab, if I can give you confirmation that you're abnormal, and then the next time you step on your daughter's toe, you can say something like, oh, sorry, that wasn't me. That's my mental illness. Uh, uh, oh, so sorry. So sorry. I just spent a lot of money. I got bipolar. Ah, uh, so sorry. I just, uh, you know, had sex with the neighbor. I, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. You now have a way, if you call it a disease, you have a way to relinquish responsibility for certain portions of your life. Mm -hmm. Again, what I want to make really, really clear, I know it's somewhat redundant, is under no circumstances am I diminishing the pain of life or the fact that we sometimes make really stupid moves as humans. Right. Very, right. very wrong decisions. We sometimes make mistakes that are dead serious and wrong. I'm not suggesting that that doesn't happen or that that's made up or that's in your head. On the contrary, what I'm suggesting is that that is a absolute fundamental component of what it means to be a human being. Right. Absolutely. Right. And so when we get that, we start with embracing it all. And we look across the table like I was doing in 1980 with those kids or like I was doing in 1962 with my brothers and my parents. And you start getting that, oh, communication and connection is at the heart of all healing. Oh, this is really interesting. It remains so what little Freddie knew in the playpen, what I learned at the mental health facility, what I know now is that communication and connection are at the heart of all healing, period. There's no healing that takes place without that. Right. So we fast forward again and we see that as a natural art, you know, as a nat, you could see why my elementary school teachers remember me. Um, a, a, the the art of conversation translated very well for me to become a podcaster. So I created the Welcome to Humanity podcast, 
had that really fun podcast, delivered over 100 episodes, had some really great people, some of the people that you've had on your show, I had on mine, and a really wonderful conversation. So then I started teaching people how to podcast because in this day and age, what's really happening is our true voice is being taken away from us or we're giving it up. And we're doing so oftentimes by calling ourselves mentally ill. Mm. When we start calling ourselves mentally ill, we, we, we um, diminish the impact that we're making on society around us. We're like, yeah, but he's mentally ill. Like, yeah, but she's mentally ill. It's like, no, no, you're, you're, you're not mentally ill. You're human. Right. You are not mentally ill. You're human. Now, if you need to know that you're mentally ill, all right, then I guess you're mentally ill. I mean, if you want to know you're mentally ill, I'm not going to argue with you. If it's really important to you to carry around a diagnosis called I'm mentally ill, okay. If that's working for you, you should keep doing it, please. Whatever works, do it. Right. Well, it feels like it perpetuates a story, a narrative about the self when we continue. And like you were saying, you almost, you can, in a way, scapegoat responsibility for who you are on a deeper level by placing a label. Uh, and really, a, it feels like a self-limitation uh, when, you, when you're defining yourself solely by a diagnosis because we're not a diagnosis no you're not and you're not you don't even have a diagnosis in the first place but if you did yeah you surely wouldn't be it you know yeah. and and it's interesting it is a self-limitation and it, you see that you might look at well what's the payoff of having that self-limitation it is the payoff that allows me to relinquish responsibility for the blame and shamed circumstances that leave me doing things that i'm otherwise regret or resent See, if I can get an excuse, if I could give you, if I could give you credit for all the stupid shit I've done, I, I'd do that in a second. <laughs> right. If I can pass it, I don't like it. I don't like that I got to take responsibility for the crazy shit I've done. But if I start getting that by taking on the limitless nature of being responsible for my life, I also get to take on the things that I've done that are inappropriate or that were in uh didn't ineffective or even disastrous in outcomes that i've you know decisions i made to me once we start doing that now we're starting from the land of brotherhood we're starting from the land of humanity we're starting from i get it because i am you we're starting with the idea that growth and development happens from the resonance of being heard mm -hmm. absolutely and once we're heard we all know that once you're heard once you say we all want to be heard because we all want to be loved and in order to be loved, we need to be heard and we all want to be heard in order to be heard. We need to speak, but in order to speak, we need to speak our true voice. So we need to speak our true voice so we can be heard so we can be loved. Mm. Right. That's pretty common. 7.8 billion people are agree with that. That's, right. that's not that's not that far fetched, actually. Right. And. We are slowly having that taken away from us, choked away from us, or giving it up, or choosing not to, afraid to, not making the difference we could or should, and who I now get to be as a source for that. So my most recent book, just released a couple of weeks ago, is Find Your True Voice. And Find Your True Voice is a very cool book about talking about the methodology of literally discovering what's already there underneath the muck. That is a true voice that's consistent with your core values and your authentic message. And not only then discovering it, but sharing it with others and not only sharing it with others, sharing it effectively with others so that it can actually make the difference you came on the planet to make. Mm -hmm. Now, the greatest tragedy I can think of is to actually, you know, live that life in quiet desperation and live that life so that your song is left unsung. I can't think of something more tragic than living a whole life without ever having your true voice heard. So who I am now is really the founder of uh, Find Your True Voice and the True Voice methodology. And I'm teaching podcasters how to go from zero to world-class podcast. And, uh, you know, I have a number of courses that I've taught. And, um, you know, I'm much more consistent now with my own alignment because I'm a healer. And this whole time I've been a doctor. Now I'm a healer. Like, you know, I went in to be a healer. I got sucked into the machine, became a doctor, de dealt with it for long enough started re-injecting healer then i became true healer now i'm a recovering psychiatrist i'm a transformational restorative coach it actually brings people optimization by finding their true voice and letting them express it freely
Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's a huge difference compared to what you were doing before oh, yeah. where, you know, just passing out medication. I feel like a lot of what you were saying, when we get down to the root cause of it, you know, I, I think certainly our systems and the way we have been taught to live don't necessarily support the optimization of our true voice and being able to freely express ourselves. But then, you know, it was a big realization for me to actually recognize that the only thing, even though the systems don't support it by any means, the only thing actually holding back my true voice was myself. Yeah. <laughs> like it was, it was all self-limitations. It was all, you know, what I had been programmed to believe about myself and that yeah. somehow I was not worthy. Uh, even if this was an, this was an unconscious belief, but I was not worthy of expressing uh, my true voice or that somehow it could not make a difference for others or for myself and that it was. Exactly. And so there's this, we sort of create this self-perpetuating narrative and, you know, that in turn gets into the idea that we lack or we are diseased or that we, you know, somehow are not beautiful, perfect, divine beings here to make an impact. And I think we're seeing that story really writing itself because I, I look at sort of the state of the world and I think that's just a really a macro of what's taking place on the individual state, right? The individual awareness that's going to play out on a larger scale. So, you know, I think the worst kind of censorship is self-censorship. I think the, the, the vision and the things that we're seeing and we're looking for solutions, it all starts by just looking inward and actually stopping the self-censorship and finding the true voice, finding the true poten potential. Yeah. And, exactly. you know, I think, I think when we do that, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this, I feel like, you know, we have this sort of old story on humanity and like, that's the disease, that's the uh, limited, that's the divided, this old story, this old way of being. But I feel like there's this new way that's emerging as more people are recognizing uh, sort of the potential that lives within and finding the true voice. And I feel like there's this new story that's emerging about us. And it's I'm certainly feeling it within myself and I'm beginning to connect with more and more people who are, who are feeling that same thing. Um, I mean, what would you say is that old story versus yeah. the new story? And like, how could we well, really tap into that? Yeah, it's interesting. I have looked at that. So sometimes when I give an expert, uh, when I give like a signature speech or, or a keynote, I mention something like, and I think this applies here, which is imagine if today really was the last day of your life, you just learned it's over tonight. Sorry, but this is it. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. I, I, like, no kidding. Like, oh, no, seriously, I'm not kidding. This is your last day. And for the sake of that, let's just go with cancel clear. But it, but let's bring it back to just a game. Hmm. Um, what would you do with the rest of the day? Hmm. And what you would do with the rest of the day, if you're like most of us, is go talk to some people and tell them the truth. Hmm. You already know the value of truth. Because if you were pushed up against the wall, such that you knew this was it, you would clear up those things that right now either are untrue or not confirmed truths. You would call that person and tell them that you love them or that you stole $5 from them or that you um, don't love them or that whatever it is, you would likely not tell people, by the way, that you don't love them. You would bring happiness and joy with your truth, a confirmation of you acknowledging that you've been walking around in your lie or your illusion for so long. And now that you have the opportunity and your back's against the wall, you're going to bring your truth right now. OK, so let's extrapolate from that example and get one of the things that's happened in the crazy world that we now presently live in is our mortality has been served up to us in a silver platter. We start realizing that it really is not so far fetched to think that today might be the last day of your life. It's becoming more and more true that it's possible that it's over soon. Right. And if it's possible that it's over soon, we are now pressed into altering that narrative and giving up on the illusion that we'll just do it later. When the time is right, mm. when the when you know when we're down in Jamaica living, or we're you know when we're 
Like we'll just do it when the conditions are right, when the weather's right, when the right people are there, when not when the spirit moves me. There's an immediacy and an urgency that's been injected into humanity now, realizing that whether or not you pretend to be someone or be yourself, like either of those choices will leave you with enemies. Since that's already true, that either the yourself or the person you're pretending, pretending to be in order to protect that self, and frankly, how ludicrous is that of a human decision? I'm going to pretend to be someone that I'm not in order to protect the person that I am? Oh, yeah, that's a good plan. Tell me, tell me all about that one, you know? <laughs> That's what we do, right? We think we're so afraid to show who we are that we're willing to sell our soul and actually act like someone we're not in order to protect the person that we are, which no one will ever see anyways now. Mm. Like, it's just insane. It's really, it's like, the, it's, like the, it's like the definition of insanity in some ways. Yeah. But there's an immediacy and an urgency that's been served up to us in our heart and soul that has us get, well, I guess I don't give a shit anymore to protect myself that... There's more people who are ready or even with fear or terror of speaking their true voice are getting like we would if we knew today was our last day that now's the time, today's the day and you're the one and it's time to really bring forth that true voice of yours so we can at least deal with it and listen to other people's true voices so you can hear what's really happening there even if you're in full disagreement with the person and make decisions based on a, you know, whatever confluence of facts it and actual experiences you could put together so that where you're directed has a better chance of being uh of, of being accomplished mm -hmm. and that's that's what's here i think there's an immediacy that changes the store we used to sit in which was more like someday i'll get to it to right. now's the time right no i love that answer and i definitely resonate with what you're saying because i think that's the, the journey I found within myself, if you will, you know, when I started, when I started podcasting a couple of years ago, I don't think I had unlocked my own. Well, I know I hadn't really uh, truly unlocked my own full, uh, authentic voice, right? I hadn't necessarily, uh, been living, uh, in alignment with what I, what I knew to be true. And right. And so it's only been through, uh, powerful conversations and working, looking inward and actually committing to truth and sort of taking an approach of a radical responsibility to stand by that. And, you know, certainly we all have blind spots. So, I mean, if we come across areas where we, we, we haven't necessarily been committed to that, that's not to hold ourselves in a place of judgment. You know, we're only human. We're our, we're going yeah. to continually make mistakes and uncover uh, and continually awaken to that. But, you know, it, it's, I definitely recognize that at one point, you know, I look at the state of humanity or I look at somebody who is, you know, suffering from quote unquote, I guess, sickness, or they're not living in alignment with who they are. It's like, I see that within myself. I recognize that that's where I was. And I think that's part of the, uh, the world we grow up in. And the, yeah. that's, that's the programming, if you will. And to fully unlock yourself, you have to be willing to let go of the programming. There almost needs to be like a, like a death, like an accept, I would say almost an acceptance of death as it is and a death of the old self, you know, yeah. there, there needs to be, I think our fear of death and the fear of unknown plays a huge role in that because you really do have to let die the old, what you know to be, or what you thought to be true, uh, let the illusions die so that the truth can come into sight. And that's a incredibly difficult challenge for all of us, especially when death is something that, you know, the stories that we tell about ourselves about sickness, a lot of times there we're trying to be cured so we can strive, so we can uh, keep death away, right? That's sort of the, um, you know, that's the yeah, underlying. It's all, our, it's all about our fear of death. Ultimately, all the fears of anything are really about our fear of death. And the fear of death is a, such a fascinating concept since. As it turns out, the only thing that's inevitable in this life, like the only thing, period, like the, it's not death and taxes. That was actually something that Abraham Lincoln uh, put into the, put into the uh, rhetoric when people weren't paying their taxes. That was, <laughs> but this isn't that. This is actually 
death is the only inevitable aspect of this life. That is the only thing we are absolutely guaranteed, whatever death looks like. I mean, maybe, you know, we have different views of what happens after that moment. But the one thing that is certain is that we're going to die. And um, to have that be the thing that we are most afraid of and have it be inevitable is just even more ludicrous than what I said earlier, which was pretending to be someone we're not in order to protect the people that we are. Yeah. Humans make some pretty funky decisions every so often, dude. They, they, <laughs> they, these are a couple of them that make that are just wild in their like there's no radical there's no rational understanding of how it is we need to be so terrified of the only aspect of life that is inevitable which is death i too am terrified of it i'm not i mean i get it i can sometimes be cool about it i sometimes you know have seen the light of eternity or divinity or infinity i'm like okay it's cool it's cool death is just an illusion anyways and but in the end i'm I'm just as eager not to die as anyone. Right. And, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't have this thing entirely under control. And and it, it, I think you point to such a good good uh, deal because, you know, such a, a good um, example because the ultimate conundrum is that we're so, we're so, we're willing to kill ourselves in order to avoid death. Mm. And we see it often. All day. Mm. Wow. That's, that's actually a, a fantastic point. I had not thought about the nature of like, cause you see the increasing suicide rates, right? We see the, the, like the finality of that decision to perpetuate the, the story built off the fear of death. And it's, but it just makes you really think how it is that we've become so perpe perpetuated and trapped within this cycle. And if this is the this is the quote unquote perceived normal, the perceived normal way of living, uh, how, how radically we need to open ourselves up to change that because that's the idea of that being a normal. And it, it is like a normal thing. Like suicide is very normalized in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Uh, the idea of that being normal, like long-term, obviously we, I think a lot of people would love to eliminate things like suicide and mental illness, but the way that we're continuing to live and, and I would say the path that a lot of people are taking, like it's, it only perpetuates it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to open ourselves to a radical uh, new way. And that is, you know, unlocking our creativity, actually exploring. Cause I think the path of self-exploration is ultimately the only only path to really take i mean is, is that is that when you were taking them off of like patients of medication for example yeah was that sort of in a collaboration with the self-explorative path for them was yeah. there what what sort of other steps were they like yeah. uh, i guess engaged in because that's you know i think that type of work is is vital because, you know, we do have sort of a pharmaceutical racket. We do have these drugs that are being prescribed at record time rates becoming the, uh, almost life pills for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that, that other alternative path, I think really needs to be like highlighted. So people can't like, maybe I think a lot of people maybe just don't know what the other way is. And they no, might even subconsciously don't. know that these medicines and this sort of story that they're perpetuating isn't doing any good for them. Yeah. Well said. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is exactly what we would do. So the first thing is, is to kind of prep the person. First of all, check to see, as I said before, if, if this present lifestyle, which includes a diagnosis and a bunch of treatment is actually working for you, then there's no need to change. It's fine. It's, it's totally fine, actually. If you and your family and your caregivers and they're all sure, like this is as good as it gets and as good as it's gonna get and there's nobody arguing, more power to you, good for you, keep doing it, keep doing what works. You only get one life. If this is as good as it's gonna get, by all means, absolutely keep doing it. Right. All right, that's not, is this, this conversation is not for you exactly, except to say, good for you. You found something that works and you should do it. 
I, I can't even underline it enough, so I'm going to say it a fourth time. If you found something that works, then do it. Absolutely. Everybody has their anything, own path. I don't got anything better than something that works. If, if you found it, it works. I, seriously, please do it. Congratulations. But there's a whole group of people that underneath it all, like you just said, you know, know that it isn't really working. They know that it's like a Band-Aid with a razor blade embedded in it. Mm. They know that these medicines are actually causing them to be worse. They know that the diagnosis doesn't really match who they know themselves to be. They know all this. And if that's who you are, then it's time to make a change. And that has to happen with a conversation. That has to happen with a powerful conversation. And it has to happen in the world of creativity. So you had mentioned that. And the Creative 8 got written on the back end of some of that work. Uh, Creative 8, healing through creativity and self-expression. If this is interesting to you, what you get is that when you're creating, in the act of creating, like, like mm, art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, gardening, those kinds of things, then negative experiences or uncomfortable experiences dissipate during that time. Even if what you're doing is playing the blues or drawing a dark photo or taking a dark photo, you know, um, it's fine. It, it, when you're expressing it, there's a release. There's a resonance with the world around us. And by being expressive, self-expressed, so many of these negative experiences come out in ways that are like an exhaust system or a, a, a way of being heard. We all just want to be heard so that we can be loved. So when I was taking people off of medicine, that is what I was letting them do. It's like, go love yourself, go be passionate with yourself. Number one, you know, go take care of your very, you know, be mm, like, pom like pamper yourself, you know, like take beautiful care of yourself, but also take care of the people that you, you know, and love or who are near and dear to you. And also be creative. So in other words, art, music, dancing, singing, etc., really do help a lot. And that's why we're here to do it. And not just looking at people's art or listening to music, but actually creating art or creating music, even if all it is like that. If you just do that, you take a pen to the side of the table. That's good. That works. That's music. And really, that is music, by the way. And there's massive relief in you, you allowing me to do that in your presence. Even a little beat like that. Like that? Super cool. Mm. So creativity and self-expression are what's really being called for here in most of the symptomology, quote, symptomology we're having, because the stuff is banging around our head and we're not expressing it the way it needs to be expressed. So, yeah, I think that it's, uh, you know, that if the trade off, if you will, is to optimize people to get that even in their missing, even in the aspects of the life where they feel deficient, that that too is representative of who they are as a human. So that they, if they don't know how to do X, Y, or Z, they certainly know how to do A, B, or C, that their strengths are counterbalanced by their weaknesses and that that in and of themselves is exactly the essence of what it means to be a human being. S straight up, I'm not even making any of this shit up. I'm right. not, I just, no, what, definitely. Yeah, this is just straight up. No, I, no, I love that. And I definitely, like I was mentioning earlier, I found within myself that expression, like the the openness to... Uh, I guess, give expression a shot, you know, is ultimately exactly. what led me down the path of true healing exactly. and, and understanding, you know, what was possible for myself on the other side of my own perpetuating story. And, yeah, you know, it's exactly. interesting because I think a lot of people will run from their pain or they'll run from uh, ultimately what it is that's inside of them, whether it's thoughts, whether it's uh, and really anything that's causing the pain, causing the quote unquote diagnosis, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I recently learned what the, the true meaning of the definition of compassion was, for example. And that was, if you break it down, it means to be with and then suffering. So if you're to be compassionate is to be with suffering. And, you know, I think it's no coincidence that those who have been through the healing path and those who have really, uh, 
sat with their own suffering and their own pain are the ones who are the healers. They're the ones who can help guide others into healing. They're the ones who can, you know, really empathize in a lot of these situations. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think the greatest service we can do for the world is to be compassionate. So how do we be compassionate? It's to actually sit with our own pain. It's to actually sit with our own suffering. You know, we're not just impacting ourselves. Certainly we are impacting ourselves by uh, running from our running from ourselves and running from pain and um, being in self-sabotaging cycles. But, you know, we're also really impacting others because there's so much healing that we can bring for others when we unlock our creativity, when we unlock our gifts, when we unlock our voice. You know, there's so much that others actually gain from that, probably more so than we gain from it. Like there's a, there's a lot that we gain from it and we are able to step into our authenticity. But the true, uh, I think if we took a bird's eye view and looked at the ripple effect, really the dominoes falling from our own creative force, uh, we would be we would be dumbfounded on the For type sure. of impact that that can have. And I don't think people recognize what a service to humanity it is, to service to the planet, to service to really all that is and all that ever will be uh, to actually be ourselves fully and express ourselves fully. Like there's no greater gift that we can give to the world. It's fascinating what you're saying. You're pointing to two things here. Number one, not only the content of what your true voice then has to offer, but by creating the space of actually being your authentic message, of actually carrying on your true voice, of actually being one who can and does be their core values, bring those forward or their core message in such a way that takes into consideration who and where are you speaking it? Because it's not just a matter of blurting and spitting out things that have been harbored for a while. That's, right. that is not what I'm talking about with true voice. It's not like tell that person to fuck off. It's not, I, that's not necessarily what I'm talking. It may be good. It may be good. Maybe that is what you need to do, but it's yeah. not necessarily that if that's going to move the needle forward, then you should do that too. You know, but if it's just making you give give you the opportunity to regurgitate your painful stuff onto the ground or spit it onto somebody else that leaves them in pain, that doesn't seem so valuable. But I think what you're speaking to is that when you're around someone who's authentically aligned with that that they're expressing, there's a resonance and an inspiration that may indeed be the largest influence that any human can have on any human is to be your authentic self as you just expressed. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we look at sort of the great minds of our time or those who were role models or made a positive difference, whether really it be in any field, those people were themselves authentically, right? We didn't have anybody who was, you know, really hiding within their shell that move the needle forward for all of us, right? You know, we have, we have to be willing to step outside of our comfort zone and uh, well, step that, into an authentic that, role. Yeah. You're, you're pointing to my next uh, event. So two weeks uh, from now, I'm, I'm uh, hosting an event called the, we, the people summit. And I'm in, I'm interviewing a number of very high level international influencers about how they became inspirational international influencers. And and, you know, what, basically it's a 20 minute or so interview podcast style of these 18 or 24 folks that I've already already who have agreed to be in the summit. It's a fundraiser for the um, humanitarian needs in Ukraine. My wife is 100 percent Ukrainian, so hmm. going to refugees and children and displaced people or, you know, people who are more who are living through that devastation in that country and hopefully and, and also in other countries that are war torn. But anyways. This idea of like, in order to move the needle forward, one has to then become immediately or, or, or gradually move towards their own alignment and speak their true voice. And that's when it um, that's when it initially becomes possible to be an honest influencer. If what you're doing is speaking duplicitous, just duplicitously misaligned with who you who you really are, you're only going to move the needle forward long enough to get out of the room after you told your lie. Mm-hmm. Right. Every, everyone's going to feel that misalignment and it's not really going to move any needles forward. Except, oh, there's another person pretending to be somebody in order to protect their real self. What a shame. Right. Even if you're spitting some really cool shit, 
even if you're saying some really, really super cool shit, if it's misaligned with who you are, it's not moving any needles forward. Right. And others recognize that. And we all do. We all do. Yep. We right. all know. We, we, we all, uh, we all are, uh, BS detectors, all of us. <laughs> right, because we know within ourself when we BS, and so it's very easy to spot when somebody not else is going hard, down. That. Not hard at all. Uh, especially when you've been on the uh, the path of optimizing your own communication, it's like, okay, I see what I see exactly what you're doing here, and you yeah. know, it's yeah. it's interesting because I feel like that type of uh, dialogue, if you will, is very normalized in a lot of our systems and culture. So uh, it's, if anything, though, I do, I do recognize that I feel like there is a more emerging, and I think I mentioned this earlier, emerging, um, I would say, higher truth within our dialogues. And I, and I'm just noticing this within the conversations I'm having every day, like I'll go over to the gym and like in the sauna, the people I talk with, like I, I leave like feeling blown away by some I of the know, conversations I, I'm having. Yes, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I, I just think that the urgency is here. Yeah. Um, I, I feel very lucky to have become sort of a front edge of the importance of finding true voice and not having to use, you know, the knowledge here is just rooted from little Freddie with his two fingers on the playpen, on the playpen bars, watching my brothers and my parents speak and getting that communications at the heart of all healing. I mean, that's all this really is. Mm. You got something bigger than that. You should go do that. But I don't know what's bigger than that. If you got something bigger than that, then go do that. And so I get to be, I get to have taken the path of having daily soul sacrifice in my little world, a very privileged world, I might add, you know, I've had a very privileged world in the greater scheme of things. And I had my plenty of share of my own, uh, my own degree of sync of, of um, s significant pain and suffering. Um, and I suppose that does come bleeding out, like you said, who, who best who best, but the people who've been through a life to be able to bring forth a, a resonance with the difficult ways of what it means to be alive. But mm. you know, the opportunity is really to step into our true voice now, like actually get that mm, there's not much left, not many excuses left to continue to be pretentious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There just isn't. I, I mean, you want to keep doing it. I, I definitely agree with you. There's what, what reason is there besides to stay in the, the comforts of misery, really? Uh, yeah, pretty much. And that's fine. You can, I get it. I really, I love you still the same. I'm gonna say no Fully, judgment. You know, good decision. Yeah, it's a good decision. If that's all you got, dude, rock on. <laughs> right. And I think I think most people listening know that's not all they got. So <laughs> right. They, You're right there. That's exactly right. I think most people who would be attracted to your show anyways will already know. They already know. They're already dreaming and thinking about that, you know, just given who you've interviewed and given how this has gone, they already know that there's there, there's there's still gas in the tank for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. Right. No. So Dr. Fred, we're at about an hour. I mean, this actually really flew by. I, you know, I just looked at the clock and I was like, oh my gosh, we've already been chatting for an hour. Um, is there, is there any sort of last thoughts that you have? And I guess for looking at the world today and, you know, you've touched on so many beautiful, wonderful concepts about communication and opening ourselves up to our authenticity, creativity, mm. you know, I think a lot of people are looking uh, at the future with fear. They're looking at sort of the direction that we're moving in uh, collectively. And it's easy to get lost in a lot of the chaos and turmoil. Do you have, I mean, maybe a vision for what you see um, a direction we're moving into or what can be an ideal vision? Maybe not even the direction that we're going to move in in terms of prediction, but what you would like to see from individuals and how that can you know, collectively shape the world that we're meant to be living in. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it'd be sure fun to be able to sugarcoat a real answer here. I, <laughs> I, I don't have one, but I have, I have a couple things. In preparation for the We, we the People Summit, which will be at we the people summit, um, dot online, we the people summit dot online, it is, um, I'm really learning a few things. Number one, 
It takes four things to make a difference. It takes our coming in touch with who we are, our true message, number one. Number two, it takes willingness and then capacity to actually self-express that. Uh, number three, it takes creating a community, even if that community is one, if no one's hearing you, then you didn't self-express. It's sort of like a tree in the woods. So you got to have at least a listener, if not an audience. And number four, it takes technology. In other words, what is the delivery system that that allows for that message to be disseminated, right? To be, right? So yeah. in our pleasant present world, if enough people stood up for their true voice, and listened for people who were speaking their true voice who might otherwise be in a direct adversarial in some of these more mm, uh, divisive, you know, um, mm, um, uh, uh, topics that are in, that are circulating around the world. And then use the media that's still here, for God's sake, at least for another day. You know, before it gets toasted, the, the, uh, you know, the un, the, the power of podcasting is that it's still an uncensored, unmonitored, unmitigated, uncancelable delivery system in which you own your own material and could say what you want and get it out to the world in, in super spades, mm -hmm. like millions at a time. We think only Rogan and Winfrey and stuff are the ones delivering at millions at a time. It's not, dude. You can get this shit out to millions. Yeah. It is then that the world could potentially take a turn away from the default future that you didn't want me to predict for you that may um, not be so bright. Right. Uh, and so is there a hope? Yeah, there's a hope that somehow this notion of catching up with the instantaneous availability of your true voice being self-expressed effectively into a world that's really waiting and eager to receive it, and then getting that done could be enough to actually turn over this freaking nonsense. Right. Yeah. That's what I say. Oh, you know, amen. Oh, absolutely. And whatever the future lies ahead we'll we're, we'll deal with the suffering and be at peace with what is but until then let's let's use that sense of urgency to you know craft the future that we know is possible and the yeah. one that we feel within our hearts and if it comes about if as long it great if it doesn't as long as we did our best hey what what can we do otherwise right you know right. exactly <laughs> be at peace with with our own uh our own sovereignty if you will. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So, yep. awesome. Uh, this is, this has been a fantastic conversation. Is there anywhere you'd like to send the listeners, whether it's your website or social links sure. or. I think, uh, you know, there's a couple of bits and places. Uh, the true voice community is on Facebook. That's one of the places where you can come and be part of that community. Number two, I have a book that I just wrote that is, uh, if, if what I'm saying is resonating with you, you want to have a call with me, please, uh, uh, go to findyourtruevoicebook.com and uh, you can, uh, I'll send you a copy, a free copy of that book and, um, you know, take a look at that, take a look at what I'm up to. If this is something that you feel like you could benefit from some conversations or some of the offerings I have in courses or in masterminds and um, in uh, uh, groups that I'm setting up, communities, then I'd be love to talk to you more about that. Um, and then there's my website, which is also going through revision as I do, which is called uh, welcome to humanity.net. So Dr. Fred at welcome to humanity.net and then my true voice community on, on Facebook and uh, the find your true voice book.com. And if this does get aired early enough or even after the summit, the summit's on March 26th and the summit is called uh, the We the People Summit. Mm -hmm. And that's we the people summit dot online. So awesome. Awesome. I'll put all of that in the episode show notes. And I, uh, I was going to say, I'm literally going to put up the podcast this week. So <laughs> I, 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 I have a very quick turnaround. So everybody can uh, know, especially if you're listening, you know, right after this podcast is released, that summit is coming up. And uh, I would encourage everyone to go check out Dr. Fred's work and get in touch with him because, you know, the work that you're doing is truly powerful. And I recognize that, you know, what you are bringing to people, the service that you are offering and what you have found. And uh, I don't think there is anything that is more liberating 
for uh, for ourselves when we can learn self-expression when we can actually yeah. be ourselves authentically so i think exactly. you know thank you for the work that you do because i think it's thank truly you. important really great thank you thank you it's great to be with you a great conversation you're a really great interviewer a great podcaster and i really enjoyed being on your show uh, thank you thank you we'll, def we'll definitely have to plan it again uh in the near future as long yeah. as the as long as the outlet exists you know right. let's <laughs> let's, make, let's make it happen so exactly Exactly. All right, everybody, all right. thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we shall see you all next time.